Hello, welcome to Transmissible Briefs. Today we talk about Candida auris as we take a look at the ECDC Rapid Risk Assessment. If you want to refresh your knowledge about this infection, then this podcast may be useful for you to complete. A Rapid Risk Assessment on Candida auris was published on December 16 by the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC. It explained that the ECDC Point Prevalence Survey of 2011 and 2012 among European hospitals, candida species were found in the top five of common bloodstream pathogens. And in recent years, a shift towards an increasing proportion of non-candida albicans was seen, and candida albicans is the most prevalent candida um, uh, found uh, pathogenically. An important reason for publishing a risk assessment was the occurrence of nosocomial outbreaks of Candida aureus in 2016 in Spain and in the UK, and in addition resistant isolates were reported from Norway and Germany. So let's have a closer look at the organism that causes this concern. Candida is a genus of yeast and it is the most common cause for fungal infections worldwide. There are over 150 species of Candida, but only 15 of these are known to cause infections. Candida albicans lives in 80% of the human population without causing harmful effects, although overgrowth of the fungus results in candidiasis. Candida species are usually harmless inhabitants of our skin or gut, the word commensal means those whom we share a meal with, and an endosymbiont means an organism that shares our life with us, inside us. However, when our natural defense barriers are weakened, these usually harmless guests may cause a lot of damage and disease. And the natural defenses include the healthy skin and gut flora. The population of microorganisms that live with us daily and keep us alive even is called the microbiome. When we're healthy, the microbiome includes 10 times more individual organisms than the number of cells in our body. It is what some people call our sixth vital organ. Then the second defense is intact barriers between the outside world and our internal environment. Skin and mucosa provide a thin layer of tissue protecting us against intruders. And then finally, we have the more sophisticated immune system. A healthy immune system starts in our skin and mucosa, followed by antibodies and white blood cells that actively detect and remove microbiological intruders and toxins. These are the three defense systems that work closely together. If one fails, then the chance that a pathogen successfully infects us increases. If more than one fails, then even the most innocent symbiont will be able to generate infection and disease. In case of regular and prolonged damage of the skin on our feet, yeast like candida can cause infection. A common form of candidias is restricted to the mucosal membrane, in the mouth for example, is thrush, which usually easily is cured in people who are not immunocompromised. And then for example, a higher prevalence of colonization of candida albicans was reported in young individuals with a tongue piercing in comparison to unpierced matched individuals. There's also some candida that have actually an industrial use. Candida antarctica is a source of industrially important lipases. The Kalbi lipase is one of the most widely used biocatalysts in organic synthesis on both laboratory and the commercial scale. Candida albicans has been used in combination with carbon nanotubes to produce stable electrical conductive bio nanocomposite tissue materials that have been used as a temperature sensing element. When the immune system is compromised, then candida may be able to penetrate our body further and cause bloodstream infection or damage to the major organs. This may be the case with HIV infections or diabetes. Systemic infections of the bloodstream and major organs, candidemia or invasive candidiasis, particularly in immunocompromised patients, affect between 30 and 40,000 people each year in Europe. Approximately 30 to 35 percent of all episodes of candidemia occur in ICU patients, that is, in the intensive care unit of hospitals. These infections are serious and have a high fatality. Between 40 and 60 percent of the cases at the ICU do not survive the impact of a candida bloodstream infection. The five most common candida species are Candida albicans, Candida glabrata, 
Candida tropicalis, Candida parapsilosis, and Candida cruciae. So in the case of Candida, the transmission chain is relatively simple. The organism is all around us, since 80% of us carry it on our skin or healthy mucosa. Now let's imagine the left of the screen is the outside world, or the external environment, and the right of the screen is the internal environment, so everything that happens in our body. Now humans are a key reservoir for Candida where mainly close contact and fomites, such as sharing clothes and towels and possibly medical instruments, may continue to introduce us with new Candida species. And Candida albicans is the most important nosocomial fungal pathogen that can survive up to four months on surfaces. Now, in a hospital environment, surfaces with which hands come in contact are often contaminated with nos nosocomial pathogens, and they may serve as vectors for cross-transmission. A single incidence of hand contact with a contaminated surface results in a variable degree of pathogen transfer, say the researchers. They found that when surfaces are contaminated with E. coli or Salmonella or Staphylococcus aureus, then there is a 100% chance that touching it will transfer these pathogens to your hand. And this chance is also 90% for Candida. The key barriers that prevent Candida to enter our internal environment are formed by our intact skin and the strength of our immune system. This means that the problems start when our barriers go down. That will open the door for Candida to cause infections in the most vulnerable of our tissues. Without competent immune response, this will most of the time lead to invasive disease such as bloodstream infection and infection of major organ systems. And this has a high fatality. A fatal outcome between 30 and 40% of the bloodstream infections has been reported in general for Candida. Yet, among intensive care patients, a Candida bloodstream infection may increase to 60% case fatality. And obviously, cases with Candida infections will also be infectious, transmitting the agent to their contacts, such as the doctors, the nurses, and other patients. Now, Candida auris will transmit in a similar way as other Candida species. What type of infections can Candida auris cause? It has caused bloodstream infections, wound infections and ear infections. In fact, auris is the Latin word for ear. Candida auris has also been isolated from respiratory and urine specimens, but it is unclear if it causes infections of the lung or bladder. Candida auris is diagnosed like other Candida infections, usually by fungal culture of blood or bodily fluids. However, Candida auris is harder to identify from the culture than others. For example, it can be confused with other types of yeast. Special laboratory tests that use molecular methods are needed to identify Candida auris. Now, who is at risk for infection from Candida auris? Limited data suggest that the risk factors for Candida auris infections are generally similar to the risk factors for other types of Candida infections. These risk factors include recent surgery, diabetes, broad-spectrum antibiotic and antifungal disease, and central venous catheter use. Infections have been found in patients of all ages, from preterm infants to the elderly. Further study is needed to learn more about risk factors for Candida auris infections specifically. Now we are fortunate to have the opportunity to ask some questions about Candida auris to Dr. Anna Alustrie Iskerdo. She is the mycology expert from the Mycology Reference Laboratory of the Instituto de Salud Carlos Tetero in Madrid, Spain. She was one of the contributing authors of the ECDC risk assessment on Candida auris on December 19. Dr. Alustrui visited a mycology conference on the 20th of January in Nijmegen, the Netherlands and made some time available to explain more details about Candida auris. First of all, welcome uh, to and thank you very much for, for joining the podcast. It's a, it's a really big pleasure and it's a nice coincidence that you are visiting the Netherlands uh, because you have been involved in the, contributing the ECDC risk assessment of the Candida auris. And I have to admit uh, that when I read the risk assessment, um, I, before that time, I had never heard of Candida auris. Is this something that I've missed in the past, or is this an emerging pathogen? 
So thank you first for inviting me. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you. And I think it's a very interesting question. So the first uh, description of Candida auris was in 2009 in, uh, in a Japanese patient from an air swap. So, and since then uh, it has been, uh, a, it, it was uh, isolated in 2011 in several patients in a Korean hospital and as it was uh, demonstrated to be nosocomial pathogens there. And since then it has been reported worldwide in India, South Africa, in the US. Now there are big outbreaks in US, in UK, we have in Spain as well. So um, we have searched for in our collections that we have been identifying since 2011 from molecular methods and we mm -hmm. had none. And suddenly it's appearing everywhere. Uh, so yes, it is an emerging pathogen. Yeah. It, did, did our uh, diagnostic technique change or, or do you believe that somehow the organism really started to, to appear no, for some reason? It's nothing that it has changed because we, we've been screening the same like molecular identification since 2011 in our reference center and we had none until now. Mm. And now it appears so we are able to detect it but we were not detecting it. So it, it appears. It, it appears that it has emerged somewhere mm -hmm. in several places at the same time, apparently, and they are not all related. So they have, they are different clusters in in the in these strains. So yeah. it's a it's like a mystery. Okay, so uh, so as a nosocomial infection, uh, we already uh, know several pathogens. Uh, MRSA is a very well known one. Is the Candida auris, is it very similar or very different from MRSA in terms of the impact and the measures that you have to take in hospital? Well, control measures are almost the same, so we recommend to isolate the patients, to be very uh, strict with the personal protection equipment, to clean the, uh, the hands and everything. It, to be very careful about this. But apparently, Candida auris is uh, transmitted from one patient to the other quite uh, easily. So mm. in, in, I think in the UK they said that in four hours one pa patient got infected with, the, with another patient strain in less than four hours. So it's very easy to transmit this. And, and apparently the control measures that uh, they've seen that uh, chlorine and uh, peroxide are better to disinfect than chlorexidine towels, that apparently it can be a bit uh, resistant to chlorexidine mm. towels. So they are trying to promote to use a very good disinfection method for this. And also it has been isolated all around the, the, the room of a patient infected with that. So the, the bed, the bench, the walls, it's all around. Whenever mm. the patient is infected, it's all around it. Right. And peroxide is really much stronger than, than hexidine, yeah. so... Okay. But the problem is that it's not as easy as, as it is with chlorexidine towels to mm. disinfect with, uh, with peroxide. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's something that it has to be taken into account. Mm. So um, we have seen the, in the risk assessment um, th the importance of diagnostics, uh, that it manifests itself as bloodstream infections. What are the clinical symptoms? Is is the clinical symptom very similar to other blood uh, bloodstream infections, or is there something particular yeah, with candida? No, it's uh, the only thing is that they have different. Uh, uh, so if, for example, if you are an, under antibiotics and sometimes you have a candida there and the other one, the only thing it's like you need to have a culture of candida for out of their blood. But uh, yeah, fever and all the same symptoms and, and as mm. a bloodstream infection and then you recover the candida from blood. Right. And the problem with this is, uh, strain is that it's not easy to identify them with uh, regular methods, with routine methods. So you really need to do Malditov and it has been included just lately in the last libraries. So the ones that are old, it, they were not able to identify them. But now the new, the current libraries they do and also our molecular identification but if you use bitech or other commercial methods or chromagar 
Uh, it, it's uh, misidentified with other species of candida and non-candida species. So mm -hmm. th that's how you can mis misdiagnose this species. Okay, so it's really important for laboratories to be aware that they need different tools to really differentiate between candida albicans and, c and yeah. detect that it's candida auris. Yeah, right. it looks like candida emuloni, which is not also frequent, a uh, frequent pathogens, but it can be misidentified with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, with Candida cruciae, with uh, Rhodotorula as well. So it, depending on the platform that you use, it can be misidentified with other mm -hmm. uh, s species. Yeah. Okay, so so far we have talked about the um, uh, importance in, in clinical setting in the hospital. Um, what is relevant for, for the laboratory to know in terms of their diagnostic tools and the set. What would you say is the most important thing that a public health officer in a region or in a country needs to remember about Candida auris? So it's very important that it's resistant to fluconazole, which is one of the uh, treatment elections, so the treatment therapies for Candida. So it's highly resistant, mm. and all strains are intrinsically resistant. Uh, uh, several strains have also been uh, described to be resistant to boriconazole, posiconazole, so many azoles, but also at least uh, one third of the strains are also resistant to amphotericin B and some strains to uh, kinocandins as well. So it could be a multi-resistant pathogen and pan-resistant pathogen. Mm. And also that it's important to identify the species. So with routine uh, work, you would not recognize it. So you really m have to be sure that if you have uh, candidemia, which is not uh, with candida albicans, then you better check if this could be, because it's really spread easily mm. and it can cause an outbreak in uh, in a minute. Okay, so the resistance is really something of concern. Do we still have some uh, some uh, some uh, medicines that are really effective, or is there a concern that there is not so much that is really working? Um, it depends on the strain. So. Uh, not all the strains are pan-resistant, so um, apparently echinocandines do work about um, in most of the strains, but there are some strains that are pan-resistant. The only thing is that uh, it's not as virulent as Candida albicans, mm. so we think that it, it's not going, so the mortality rates has not, are not as high because they are less virulent, but in, in very severely monocompromised patients that could be a big difference so yeah okay well anyway thank you very much for taking the time also to giving us the highlights of the ECDC risk assessment to giving uh, giving us the summary uh, of what we really should remember after uh, having read it um, and I wish you a successful conference uh, tomorrow as well and, uh, and a good trip back to Spain and thank, thank you very you. much thank okay. you so we have talked about prevention and control of the disease let's summarize the measures on top are good standard infection control in health care facilities, including environmental cleaning and proper hand hygiene. And of course this should be in combination with adequate reprocessing of medical devices that can be contaminated. And in addition, there should be sufficient capacity of healthcare facilities for patient, patient isolation and cohorting. However, even with full preventive measures, there's always the risk that organisms from a patient's own skin or gut, such as candida, may cause infection when the immune defenses are down. And therefore, adequate capacity of microbiological laboratories is another key element of preparedness, so that timely and correct diagnosis is possible. These are the basis for the prevention of transmission of any pathogen, including candida auris, in healthcare settings. Prompt notification of the clinical team and of the infection prevention and control or hospital hygiene team is essential to implement infection control precautions in a timely manner. If you want to read more about Candida Auris, here are some references that were used in this podcast. Heyman's Control of Communicable Disease Manual has a good public health perspective of Candida infections in general. The ECDC Rapid Risk Assessment of 19 December is found online, and so is the article on the first three reported cases of nosocomial Candida Auris by Lee and colleagues. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. We'll come back soon with transmissible briefs on new public health alerts.